Yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, some of you were not here, but I expect you already know who our uh, main trainer is, Vera. Um, uh, now I'll quickly go through what the G Academy is. Uh, it is a EU funded uh, Horizon 2020 project, which aims to develop and implement uh, capacity building uh, in gender equality in research and innovation. This means throughout institutions and to individuals in, inside the European research area and also a bit more abroad. Um, there are a training specifically for trainers, so it's based on state-of-the-art knowledge and expertise accord um, that are gathered from all um, from all or from various uh, members of, of the, um, the consortium and the abilities developed therein. Uh, the training material is always tailor-made and specific to the occasion, so this is a, a very um, um, let's say um, advanced trainings in some cases some are more basic we you can check our offer in in the, the link in the description and the site that you can see and as i was saying the trainings are diverse and so they target different decision makers in hr equality officers researchers some more to the general public but every training is particular in its own way and there are different formats we're having a, an online training here Fortunately, uh, we'll hopefully have uh, more in-person trainings when this situation gets a bit better. We have also workshops, webinars, some roundtables, uh, summer schools as well. And uh, we hope we like very much to see you all gather here, and we hope to see you again, of course, because our goal is to build capacity throughout uh, the entire European research area. The session format. So we're going to be here until. Uh, seven uh, till seven until five uh, Central European time. Uh, we're in right now in the introduce, in, introduction part. We're going to have uh, a presentation with some discussion in the middle by Vera about all the topics at hand here. And then we'll have a short break and we'll have group discussions in breakout sessions. In the meantime, I will. Um, I will uh, provide you with some reading materials that you might have already had or not, but I'll give you an handout and specific links to some reading materials to uh, enrich that group discussion. And then, of course, we'll join in plenary and end up by wrapping up. Please stay until the end and fulfill the exit questionnaire. It's very important for the work we do to give us a strong evaluation standpoint. I will now give the floor to Vera and keep as quiet as I can, because she's the one who's going to teach us many things today. Thank you very much. Hello, Francisco. Thank you very much uh, for the very kind introduction and um, welcome everybody to this meeting. And let me, before we start, let me say something. I'm a medical doctor, okay? I'm not a trained gender researcher. So all the things I'm telling you are really coming from the practical view, from the reality of a medical doctor and also a researcher in cardiovascular medicine. And so this session is really medically based and approaches the need of women and men in healthcare. And the, the problem is healthcare is a very complicated field. And um, therefore, if I'm using two medical terms, if I'm going too fast, please raise your hand and Francisco um, will tell me uh, to e explain some things in more detail. Um, this is one issue and don't, don't be shy in doing this. Second, if I give examples on med in the, from the medical field, please take them as examples. They are not meant as something that you do have to know at, or that everyone has to know. They are just meant as examples 
that illustrate the need of specific forms of research. Okay, having said this, I would like to, to start and um, very briefly recall to you, I'm pretty sure that you all know this, that there are sex and gender dimensions in research and or in biomedical research. Sex is the biological difference between subjects. And we also always have to answer the question if um, our objects of research differ by sex or what is the sex of our objects of research. It's not as obvious as we sometimes think. And does this impact the results? And the next issue, um, is gender, and I'm pretty sure you all have had a lot of lectures on this. Um, that's the sociocultural between women and men. For me, um, gender exists only in human research because it requires the existence of a sociocultural environment. It means the differences in roles, in self-perceptions of human beings, in their behavior, their interaction, and in the medical field response to treatment. And finally, not only the subjects of research are important, the sex and gender of the researcher, the way how he looks at the world impacts his perception or her perception of the world. This is a very general knowledge, but we have to be aware of it as simple as it is. So let's go into more detail on the sex and gender dimensions in health and medicine. Same structure of the slide as the previous one, but, but with more focus on health and medicine. Differ the objects of our research in physiology by sex? Do the uh, animals differ in metabolism, in organ function? And the next question, are the differences in physiology adequately studied and included into treatment options? For example, sometimes if we look at cell cultures, the culture of the cells or of the cell lines that we are investigating is not even known since previous researcher, researchers did not care about this. So there is an issue where we really have to look of the, if the sex specific, specific physiology has been studied. And then obviously the question, if does impact the outcomes. Gender, the sociocultural difference in the medical field, we have to be aware whether women and men do have the same access to care, if they make equal use of care. What is the risk perception and the perception of disease of women and men? Patient-doctor interaction plays a role and is different between male, male pairs, female-female, or female-male, male-female pairs. Adherence and compliance is different. And also underlying concepts of being a woman or a man of sex and gender does impact the treatment and the behavior of patients as women or men. And again, sex and gender of researchers has an impact. So this is a very general assembly of principles. And I will try to go into more details. Well, I think you all know what the basal concepts of sex and gender are. So, Let's, actually this slide has somehow been destroyed. It dis 
depicts the sex, the biological facts of being a woman and man, the chromosomal issues, the sex on the left slide. And um, it depicts on the right side, the gender issues and there are some headings have disappeared, but I think it's quite clear from, it can be quite clear that this behavior of a person is a gender issue and the person chooses environment, but the environment also determines what options the person has. So this is the gender side of health. And this gender, all the environmental stimuli, these influence the sex, the biology, because differences in nutrition, in stress, in um, exposition to risks, this influences biology. And on the other side, the biological sex, the sex hormones affect behavior. Estrogen stimulates caring functions, testosterone stimulates more aggressive behavior or growth processes. So we have this duality between biological sex and gender everywhere in the medical field. And I would now like to go with you on some sex and gender related hypothesis in healthcare and health research. Usually our teaching books and also the studies that you can read, the clinical studies and the contracts of the assurance companies, they all assume that symptoms and manifestations of disease in women and men are very similar or are equal. And during my presentation, I will discuss with you if such hypothesis can be confirmed or negated or whatever. Um, and I will give you and here I will use myocardial infarction and a specific form of a disease. Next question is if the mechanisms of disease are the same and are the same in women and men. You, that's very important for prevention. Um, if we want to, pre to prevent diseases, we must understand the mechanism. And if we make the assumption that the mechanisms are the same in women and men, this is a very strong assumption, assumption. And I will show you some examples. Then most doctors, most assurance companies and most um, guidelines make the assumptions that medical diagnosis must not be stratified for sex. And we should discuss this hypothesis. Also the same for epidemiology and risk factors, awareness and prevention. And this will be the first half of my lecture. And in the next half, I will discuss drug therapy. Yeah, sex and gender in symptoms and mechanisms. And as an example, I picked coronary artery disease. Um, coronary artery disease, usually um, the most prominent manifestation is myocardial infarction. I think you all have heard from myocardial infarction, a terrible disease of the heart that comes with chest pain. Usually this is a this is a classical textbook and you can see the typical patient is a white male and in 90% of textbook you will find that myocardial infarction, a very frequent and devastating disease, is depicted with the example of a white male that suddenly has a strong chest pain and risk factors are smoking. He just stopped, as we can see, 
too much um, work in the office. He also is just stopping, maybe overeating, maybe being a little bit obese and then not having physical exercise, but having suddenly an unexpected exercise. And the coronary arteries of such a person um, frequently look quite terrible. Um, these should be, let me just see. This should be the blood vessels of this patient. And we can see that these blood vessels that nourish the heart of this patient have stenosis, they are narrow and have calcifications. And this poorly uh, maintained coronary arteries are actually the reason for his or her disease. And if in the case of a male, the system, the symbols and so are quite well understood. Um, women can be different. Um, and here I do have a little problem with my slide. And um, therefore you cannot see this very nice woman who is sitting at her desk and is thinking why she does not feel so well and feels a little bit sick, but she does not go to the doctor. If she goes to the doctor, and usually she does it much later than the man, the doctor would do the angiogram and would see quite normal coronary arteries. And if the doctor is very well trained, he would start an infusion of a drug that can provoke spasms of these coronary artery. And then we would see the manifestation of the disease of this woman. And this is a spasm of this coronary artery. So the woman does have a different manifestation of the disease. Her coronary artery look quite different, but she can have a myocardial infarction as the man has. Um, the point is that the man in his coronary arteries usually does have, this is a coronary artery, red is the blood, yellow is the wall of the artery. And in the men, we have usually a narrowing down of the artery by calcium and fat and lipids. And we have very clearly described stenosis. In the women, we often have a more gen generalized um, thickening of the wall of the coronary arteries and the angiograms look quite different as I showed in my example. And therefore the diagnosis of coronary artery disease in women and men can be quite different. Again, typical disease of a man, this is a longitudinal section through a coronary artery. The men have lipid and calcium depositions that narrow the coronary arteries. And usually in the men, this affects the large coronary arteries. In the women, we can have a quite different pathophysiology. We can have more spasms. This means the artery look normal, but they suddenly start to get cramps. We don't know why, but sometimes it's just very cold air and sometimes it's stress, we don't know. But in the women, the arteries must, must not have these typical plaques, at least not when the women are younger. Spasms, we can have longitudinal dissections or we can just have dysfunctions. And in the women, we can have more diseases of the microcirculation. But these diseases are not so well known and we don't have enough investigations on this. <clears throat> Again, a summary, the men, typical form of manifestations of coronary artery disease 
in the men we have plug and occlusion of the arteries in the women we have spasms or we have dissections so the features are different and i think that's quite easy to understand if you have different features of the disease you may need different strategies to diagnose the disease. But nowadays, our strategies to diagnose coronary artery disease are all based on cardiac catheterization. This is the best strategy to diagnose a disease of the man, just the coronary angiograms that I showed you. They are quite good to document the disease of men. But if we look at women, and they are not as good. And therefore, if we do have women with chest pain, we have a very high number of normal findings. Um, in this study in Sweden, we even had 80% of normal findings in women below 60 years at coronary angiography. Well, a number of these women may really have been normal, having had no coronary artery disease, but not 80%. If the women present with symptoms, some of them with myocardial infarction, 80% normal findings is too high we must have missed something. And therefore, there are some um, strategies that have been proposed how women with suspected myocardial infarction or ischemic heart disease should be diagnosed. And I don't want to take you through all these um, diagrams for medical doctors. I just would like to tell you that we would need specific algorithms to identify the different disease forms that we can have in coronary artery disease of a woman. And that are quite different from the disease of a man. Therefore, if you are working in an insurance company, in health institutes, if you are planning how to organize healthcare, think about the fact, the fact that women and men may have quite different manifestations of disease and that you may need very different pathways in women and men to diagnose a disease. For this, you need to call medical expert, but please ask them if the specific manifestations of a disease are not different in women and men, and therefore sex-specific diagnostic strategies are needed. I now will talk a little bit on um, epidemiology and risk factors. Um, and this is, um, this is also important knowledge. For example, if you are working in, pub, in public health and the question is, what are the frequent manifestation of disease in women, in women and men? Um, men develop myocardial infarction earlier than women. Here you have, you have on the X axis, an age scale and you have the manifestation of coronary artery in women and men and it's quite clear that the men develop coronary artery disease at an earlier age than women but at older age women develop coronary artery disease in the same form as men but at younger ages you have to be aware that women have 
that before many menopause, they have a very low risk for myocardial infarction and atherosclerosis. 45 to 65 years, uh, women do have, um, as I mentioned, more spasms, dissections, functional diseases. And only at the older age, women have as much obstructive coronary artery disease as men. So in women, you also have to ask at what age will they develop what type of diseases. This may also ex exist for men, but in women, the age dependency and the dependency on um, of uh, disease on sex hormones is more pronounced than in men. So let's look at risk factors. We know all over the world that there are some major risk factors for myocardial infarctions. The public health researchers know quite well that smoking, obesity, and lipid, high lipids are very important risk factors. And all the green risk factors in this slide are not obviously dependent on sex and gender. They are a bit, but not too much. The big um, sex dependent risk factors are diabetes, that's a much higher in women in men, also hypertension. This is a risk factor that's severely underestimated in women and um, plays a big role. Stress, uh, stress um, a risk factor that's also plays a greater role in women. We also have a different form of stress that plays a role in women. Um, lack of exercise is very important women exercise less, if they would exercise, they would have a greater benefit than the men. Um, I now have assembled some slides to show you that diabetes mellitus increases the risk for cardiovascular mortality more in women than in men. There are some large statistics on more than 2 million persons that show you that diabetes, a frequent disease, increases cardiovascular risk more in women than in men. And this is even, I just wanted to impress you with more numbers. Um, you don't have to read the slide, just see that there are really many studies that are all telling us the same diabetes has a greater risk for cardiovascular disease in women than in men. Then we do have some risk factors that did not emerge so far in a disease, in a medicine that was mainly based on the symptoms of men. And therefore we call it it's called novel risk factors, but actually it's quite old risk factors in women. Um, disturbances in sex hormones are very important risk factors for cardiovascular disease in women. Pregnancy complications are an issue. Stress and depression, autoimmune and inflammatory diseases are very important in women and also poor socioeconomic conditions. Um, this is really, these are major issues. Depression, for example, is much more frequent in women than in men, um, either as minor depression or as major depression. These are all things that we do not yet have in the textbooks on cardiovascular medicine. Um, yeah, and therefore it's so important that you realize that textbooks are only telling you half of the truth. 
the male half. And if women comply with this truth, it's good. But if women don't comply with the truth, with the laws that we have in men, um, we have problems to diagnose and to treat their cardiovascular diseases in a good way. Let me go to the Paul. Let me just um, ask you if, um, please identify the correct answer. Um, what is the correct answer? Women do have a greater risk for, um, women do have a greater risk for myocardial infarction and atherosclerosis than diabetic women. Actually, I cannot read the, Francisco, can you read the poll? Because it's... Yes, yes, of course. Women have a greater risk for myocardial inf infarction than men. Diabetic women have a greater uh, CAD, coronary artery disease risk than men. Diabetes leads to a stronger increase in CAD risk in women compared with men. Uh, seven of, of you have already uh, selected uh, an option in this pool. We'll just wait for a few minutes. Do you, Vera, do you want to, to start some discussion now? Or do you want to keep going with the presentation? I would like, uh, if there are some questions, um, I would like to, or if you have some questions in the chat room, or if people would like to ask a question, I, I would be happy to answer some questions now, yes. Second, the, it's a very good question. And um, I think all clinical trials must really consider that women and men can have different disease mechanisms that they need different diagnosis and that they will respond differently to treatment. This will be elucidated still in the second part of the presentation. But I think it's, um, very, um, in, it's very important um, to realize uh, these issues. Thank you very much. It's very important and we must consider it in the statistics of the clinical studies from the beginning. When we do the study, we must do a stratification according to sex. Let me just give you the results of the poll. Um, um, 80 percent. But you might want to uh, uh, answer Arne's question in the chat. Chest and left arm pain are the most common symptoms for men. What are the most general symptoms to look out for women? Early warning signs and inf infractions? Um, the, well, I, I cannot see the chat. You have to read them to me. Um, the most common symptoms for the um, women are indeed um, complaints in the chest, shortness of breath, what the women also frequently have, what is not so common in men, um, this is um, fatigue, extreme fatigue, weakness, sweating, nausea. And what is also very typical for the women is the women complain about three to 10 symptoms when they have a myocardial infarction. Men usually complain just one short um, uh, pain in the chest and in the left arm. So the, the men are much more straightforward. The women offer a much broader spectrum. Arne is giving the thumbs up, so it means you're is satisfied with the answer. I'll now share the poll results. Yeah, I think most people um, gave the really um, the right answer that diabetes leads to a stronger increase in cardiovascular risk in women compared with men. Um, the first answer is not correct. Women do still not have a greater risk for MI than men over lifetime. They are getting close to it. Therefore, the idea is not so bad, but it's not perfect. And um, diabetic women do not have a greater absolute risk for coronary artery disease 
they have a greater relative risk. Um, this means diabetes leads to a stronger increase in risk. Okay, let's finish with the poll and go on with the next slides. So let's go on on sex and gender specific management and outcomes in coronary artery disease. Um, if we look at the outcomes of myocardial infarctions, very surprising, we see that younger women here shown in black have a higher mortality than men at the same age. And if we look at um, the outcomes of cardiovascular surgery, we, we have the same findings. Women, particularly younger women, do have a poorer outcome of cardiovascular surgery than men. This was really unsuspected until the first prospective studies were done. And um, we have to tell the cardiac surgeon, surgeons that they really have to control their results by sex. Um, we also see more bleeding complications in women after coronary artery interventions. We see much more complications in younger women with myocardial infarction than men. The reasons for this are not really clear. Um, it may be that hormones do play a role. It may also be that the cardiac surgeons are just not really trained to understand the complaints of the women quite well. It can be that the differences in pathophysiology do play a role. So these are very important um, issues. Um, awareness and prevention. What do women know about their cardiovascular disease? We did a study in Berlin where we asked what was the objective risk of a woman? So we classified the women according to smoking status, overweight, lipid levels, blood pressure. These are the most important issues. And we asked the women what they believe what their risk was. And we found that only 41 of the women had a correct self-estimation of their cardiovascular risk. More than half of them underestimated their risk, only 10% overestimated it. And this is very important for prevention studies because when we did further down analysis and asked which women had the strongest underestimation of their own risk, these were the old women, the jobless women, and those with a lot of social risk factors, income, poor family structures. And we realized that just those women that had the greatest cardiovascular risk had the greatest tendency to underestimate their risk because these factors, old age, joblessness, social risk lead to poor health knowledge and underestimation of risk. And at the same time, they increased the biological risk. So we really have to consider these factors, age, income situation, family status, social situation, when we estimate risks. Um, I think I have now been going through most of the factors in my table, maybe a bit quickly, and have given you examples that mechanisms of disease, diagnosis, epidemiology, risk factors, prevention and awareness, management of outcomes, the hypothesis that they are the same in women and men can be rejected in all cases. And you have to be aware in your positions 
that um, you have to treat women and men differently. And now I would just take 10 more minutes. Uh, Francisco, can I take 10 more minutes to go through drugs? I end on the gender issues. So, Bru, uh, we, we have to give a, a, a bit of an explanation on the breakouts before the break. But... Let me, okay, but let me just say a few words on sex and gender in drugs. Um, drugs are very important. Um, usually, let's stay with this slide. It shows the response to drugs in, in women in red and in men in blue, depending on the dose. And here I have two very important drugs for heart failure and hypertension. These are beta blockers and these are ACE inhibitors. On the x-axis, you have the target dose that is recommended by medical societies. And on the y-axis, you have the outcome, which is mortality or hospitalization. And in this case, you can realize, or start, let's start with the slide on the right. You can realize if I give a drug to men, it reduces the outcomes, mortality, and hospitalization in a dose-dependent manner. But I, if I give the same drug to women, I have the optimal effect at half of the guideline recommended dose. And if I increase the dose, this does not increase my effect later. Um, if I do the same with a beta blocker in the men, I have a nice effect. And in women, I have again optimal dose, the optimal effect at half of the dose. And if I increase the dose, I have even an increase in complications in mortality. And this means that we need to consider the doses specifically for women and men, and that we need lower doses for these two drugs in women and men. But the guideline keep telling us that we should use the same doses. And this is not a good idea. Um, maybe because of this fact that the women would need lower doses, we always have higher numbers of adverse effects. These are the numbers of adverse effects in women and in men for the same drug. We have about the double or the double amount of adverse effects in women compared to men. And this is true for a large number of studies and a large number of drugs. When we then look into the literature and we analyze what percentage, and these are the small gray bars, what percentage of studies report adverse effects differently in women and men, then you can see that only about 12% of all cardiovascular studies report adverse effects in women and men in a sex specific way. And I think this is really um, a, terrible, um, a terrible result. And one of the very strong requests would be that all studies must report their adverse effects separately for women and men. Yeah, and finally, in clinical trials, um, we have a strong underrepresentation of women. The red columns represent the percentage of women of female patients for some major cardiovascular diseases, coronary artery disease, heart failure, diabetes, stroke. And in yellow, you see the percentage of women in the clinical trials. So women are underrepresented in clinical trials. 
And this is the same for animal experiments. When we do drug development, most of the animal studies, 60, more than 60% are done in male animals only. And less than 10%, this is the red curve, are done in animals of both sexes uh, or in female animals. Yellow is both sexes and red is female animals. And gray is terrible. Here, the sex of the animals is not reported. So in drug development, first, when we want to develop new drug, we study animals. And here, if we are using 60% males, we cannot discover drugs that would be effective in female animals. Um, and if in 20% of the studies, we even do not analyze the sex of the animals, we cannot make any statements on which drug is good for a male or a female animal. And then if we go back to the clinical studies and we still have a severe underrepresentation um, of the women in yellow in the clinical trials, we also cannot make good conclusions on women. And I think these, um, these two effects lead to the combined effect that we do see more adverse effect in the women as shown in this slide, the upper curve are the adverse effects in the women, these are men. And if we do not report in the analysis of the clinical trials that the women do have more adverse effect, we will not learn what is going on. So um, I think um, you can now answer the next poll. Who has more adverse effects? Women, men, or the adverse effects are equal. I think this should not be too difficult. And I'm willing to take some questions on, um, um, on um, drugs and drug trials if you want or if we have some questions in the chat. Yes, we, we, we do have to wrap up this part of the, the, the session, but um, there's a, there was a question from the previous topic from Anne-Christine uh, asking if there is data to support the self-estimation of CAD risk in men, if men are more aware of their risk of coronary artery disease. Yes, men are much better aware of their risk of coronary artery disease. And this is probably because they have all the big campaigns um, have to be have been going to um, to men in the last uh, years. Um, I think you all answered this um, section correctly, answered these questions correctly, and therefore I will sum up um, quickly on the hypothesis that are related um, to drug studies. Drugs cannot be developed in male animals only and sex hormone do play a major role. So we have to reject these hypotheses. And there is also a hypothesis that drug studies do not need to be stratified according to sex. This can also be rejected. We do need to stratify um, drug studies according to sex. Um, and then we have a last very important uh, hypothesis. Um, this is that gender is not important for patient-doctor interactions, or this is not important for outcomes. Here we do have a studies where people have analyzed the outcome in female patients that were treated by female doctors at myocardial infarction and being treated by male doctors after myocardial infarctions. And this very large studies in more than 500,000 uh, patients um, in Florida showed that those women who were treated by a female doctor survived much better than those that were treated by a male doctor. And the issue was probably a communication issue between doctors and patients. And to catch 
this notion, these differences between males and females, it is very important to realize what the social cultural, the sociocultural dimension of gender is doing. And therefore, people have studied, have started studies how to measure the sociocultural dimension gender in clinical trials. And this is not too easy, and I don't want to go into details. Um, there is a publication of Pelletier that was um, is mentioned in the recommended readings. They tried to quantify gender and to develop a gender score. And they, this gender score, if it, it's very low, close to zero, the persons have more masculine characteristics. And if it's more to 100, persons have more feminine characteristics. And they characterized people after myocardial infarctions by their gender scores. And quite interesting, the men had more or less male characteristics but the women had acquired a lot of male characteristics of men and um, were not so strongly clustering in the female, in the typical feminine corner. So male sociocultural characteristics are not always identical to biological sex. This is the important message here. And the second important message is, if we characterize persons by their gender, having more feminine or masculine sociocultural roles, then we can see that these with the male sociocultural roles survive a myocardial infarction better than those with the female sociocultural roles. And this is a strong call to introduce sociocultural roles into our clinical trials. We are still far away from such an issue, um, but I think we should do it, realizing that sex, the biological sex of a human being, which is transmitted by sex hormones and by genes, and affects the embryo, a child and adults is important. But the society by setting the life conditions, the living conditions, nutrition, lifestyles is also very important. And um, we have to recognize therefore societal as well as biological effects when we want um, to integrate, when we want to develop the best medicine for women and men. I think this is the end of my um, presentation. I still have could answer the question if the undertreatment of women is related to a lack of gender equality. Maybe you can discuss this yourself in the chat room. 10% is the presentation of women in leading positions in academic medicine in Germany. Uh, from Iris, I thought when you ask for approval from the medical ethical committees before performing trials with animals or humans, you need to specify the sex of the subjects. Am I wrong? Is sex distribution or other pro population profiling not a formal requirement demanded by regulatory agencies? She asks. Um, the regulatory agencies now require that you include women and men into the trials. This is right, but they do not require that you do a um, sex-specific analysis. Well, they require some sex-specific analysis, but they do not require that you um, include um, stratification of outcomes or adverse effects by sex into your study protocol from the beginning. This is not required. Um, okay. And um, it's also desired 
that you include as many women and men um, as the, uh, that you include women and men according to their load of the disease into the studies means that if you have a disease that affects 50% women and 50% men, you have half women, half men in the study. This is desired, but it's not requested. And therefore we still have clinical studies with 10, 20% women, um, what is really a shame. Okay. And let's see the vaccination study in COVID. In all the big vaccination studies, the outcomes were not the adverse effects were not broken down according to sex. And now this major complication that we had was a typical female um, complication. Journals are, not, are also not very present and those that do have, uh, and those that do have a very low impact factor. Moreover, reviewers often do not understand the subject. Where do you think it is convenient to publish the results of works that consider gender dimension? Yeah, this is a very um, this is a very big issue indeed. Um, I made the same experience. Usually, what I do I do is um, I go to this journal Biology of Sex Differences, even though the name of this journals of this journal tells us that um, the, they are only interested in sex. They accept also a lot of uh, gender related research. Um, and actually, they accepted our last work and some other good publications um, um, on, um, on the role of gender. The major, some of, yeah. So uh, there is an. Yeah, I think these are the best. It's actually the Journal of Women's Health also accepts gender issues, but they are more interested in women, not particularly in gender. It's a difficult issue. Yeah, I hope everyone is back and um, um, not too many uh, medical problems. Um, Organizations of group works. Um, I think we can have three groups and each group with six um, persons. And the topic in group one would be the mechanisms of sex and gender differences in medicine. And the focus would really be um, to discuss the concepts, to discuss the different concepts of sex and gender and how they interact in the medical field. And um, we prepared the paper of Pelletier for you. Uh, Rodriguez gave you access here. If you look at the abstract, at the figures, and the way how they develop the sex and gender score, maybe you can quickly read the paper together, maybe you determine that one people reads the methods, one the results, one, one the discussions more carefully, and then you discuss together and look at their concept of sex and gender and discuss if you think that that's such a gender score and such a construct is a good idea or it's not a good idea because I tell you, I have seen the primary reviews of this paper and a number of reviewers had the opinion that this gender score was not a good idea at all. And some, even people from the gender scene, from really the gender oriented scientific community. So there can be a lot of objections against this concept but the concept can also be fruitful. So the questions to you, would you agree with the concept? What would you change? Um, what kind of studies would you do to work into maybe to improve the concepts? What would be the consequences for healthcare? Yeah, and you probably will not have time left um, so skip this one. Yeah, but 
this is the job for group one. Let me go to for the group two. Um, actually, I thought about having three subgroups, two, three, and four. But now um, I think it's better to have only six persons in this group two. And they should look together through the paper of Move Jarvis in The Lancet that gives an overview on sex and gender in cardiovascular diseases, inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, including COVID, metabolic and endocrine diseases. There is also a section on the concept for sex and gender. And one question would be, are these concepts, do these concepts accept sex as a flexible term or as a constant term? This is quite a difficult issue. Um, but then look at the different diseases and maybe you want to start with COVID. There is a small section on COVID. Um, look at sex and gender in different diseases in this paper from Move Jarvis. Um, and in the way I explained it for cardiovascular diseases, pick a different disease and discuss what the most important sex and gender differences may be. And if you want, limit yourself to COVID or to autoimmune diseases to make your life easier. And then important questions, are there consequences for healthcare or better, should there be consequences for healthcare? Six persons. And then the group number five, or actually group number three, sex and gender in drug therapy. There is a second paper of Move Jarvis. This guy was putting together a lot of study groups. It's a male uh, researcher, obviously. And he put together a lot of study groups and also one on sex and gender in drug therapy. Look at sex and gender aspects in drug development. What are the effects of lower inclusion of women in clinical trials? What are the reasons for the differences between women and men? Also, again, what should be the consequences for health politics for pharmaceutical industry? I hope um, you find this interesting. So again, we have the three topics, sex and gender in drug therapy, sex and gender in clinical diseases, and sex and gender differences, concepts of sex and gender. This would be our three working groups. And you may now choose and go to one room. And I leave the organization to Francisco. Thank you, Vera. Interesting, very interesting contributions indeed. I hope you all enjoyed uh, this training and learned a lot from it, hopefully, and also in became inspired to, to do change in your institutions, in our societies. I Thank you very much. And uh, see you again um, somewhere else in a gender meeting or next time. And uh, enjoy your Easter holidays. Thank you very much.